Let's see what you got. So, number one, two errors in the name. Uh, what are the two errors? Yeah, that was probably the clearest one. It shouldn't be hex one in one all. It should be hept since there are seven carbons. Is it heptene one all or is it just heptene one all is fine? All any of those would be okay. Yeah. Please find the other one. No, the stereochemistry is correct. Almost. Well, the um, 4S should be changed to 4R. Uh, no, it's actually correct. It's 4S. 5S. Should it be 5S? Um, nope, 5 is R also. Let's talk about that stereochemistry. Because um, it also illustrates a good point of something tricky about stereochemistry. So when you look, let's look at this one, which is number 4. When we rank those groups, obviously the hydrogen is fourth, and this is going to be the third priority group. So it's between this, these two. When you first glance at it, it seems like this should be the first priority, and this should be second priority. Why is that not true? That's right. You can't look at the whole groups. You have to look at each atom as it connects to that central one. So you're looking at this one and this one, and the tiebreaker between those is that this one is connected to two carbons, whereas this one's only connected to one carbon. So this one wins. Whoops. This one wins. And that's the priority, and that's S. It's very easy, especially in the pressure of a quiz or exam type situation, to just see these big groups and assume the big group is the top priority. But you have to look just atom by atom out from that stereo center. So, all right, so the same thing here. Between these two, this one gets the top priority. This, okay, so this one's more obvious, but one, two, three, and that's R. So there is actually something wrong with the stereochemistry in this molecule, but it's not either of those. Yes? What about the 4 5 dimethyl? Because the stereochemistry is different on the 4th and the 5th. Yeah. Would it be listed as just 4 5 methyl? Instead of dimethyl, because you're not actually talking about two methyls on the same carbon. Um, they don't have to be on the same carbon, actually. Any so two in the structure would be dimethyl, or if there are three in the structure, it would be trimethyl. They can be wherever. Does it have to be with cis and trans if we're talking about hydrogens? Close. Because oh. we have a bond? Is yes. E and Z, e &Z right? Oh, okay. This alkene is not, the stereochemistry of that alkene is not or specified. Is so what should it be? E. It should be E. So this should be 4s, four, four comma, 5r, comma, e, 4, 5 dimethyl hex, hept, 1, e, 1, all. All right, so that's part of the name as well. Um, anytime you have to name, assume that you have to specify all stereochemistry of Stereo centers, double bonds, any of that. Okay. That's all part of the name. Because without those things, you could be talking you could be ambiguous. You could be talking about different uh, molecules. I guess the only time that's not true is when you have uh, racemic mixtures or mixtures of diastereomers or when there's actually not one specific molecule but a couple. All right. Any other questions about that name? Okay, mechanism here. What happens first? Yeah, well. Yeah, so that, that negatively charged uh, propane, whatever you call that. We, again, we know it's not actually negatively charged, but we can write it that way as part of the mechanism. That gives you this intermediate. Then what happens? Right. What? Was that was that initially ether? No, that would be the ethoxy group. It's an ester. Yeah. 
it, it looks like an ether, but because it has this carbonyl next to it, it's an ester instead. That gives you this one. Okay. And then what? Text again. Right. So now we have another tetrahedral intermediate, but that's going to be protonated by the water to give the ultimate product, which is this alcohol. Questions about that mechanism? Are those, uh, isn't this kind of like not that useful though? I mean, I guess you, it's, it's good for adding on like no H and, I mean, is, is there, does this have like a wide variety of applications? Or is yeah. Not that often? Um, I mean, it's, it's not used that often. Certainly addition to a ketone or aldehyde is more common because the double addition is kind of a special cir circumstance. Yeah. But when you want two things that are the same on there, when you want a, you know, dipropyl something or other, um, then you'll certainly see this used. Yeah. All right, and then finally the synthesis. There are a couple ways to do this. Uh, what kind of strategies did you come up with? Um, so I started with okay. uh, HBr peroxide. Mm -hmm. So you want the alkyne route here. Um, yeah. Okay, let's let's start there. Um, remind me again, what would you start with? Okay, so this. And then you put in the acetylide. Okay. And then from there, I, uh, oh, I, I plucked up hydrogen in the acetylide using an A and H2. Okay. And then um, I used, I used, um, oh, yeah, I didn't really think about that. Yeah, that's not necessary. Okay. Um, Need it from from there. Um, wait a second. Can you can you go from from NaNH2 and then use uh, H2 and Lindmars and uh, you can't have. I'm not sure what what you would well, accomplish wanna, there. Wanna, what's the goal here? To get a, a what's it called a hydroboration oxidation. Okay, that's that's fine, but you you got too many carbons so far, right? Because here there are two carbons, and then if you use this, you're adding two more carbons on. In this case, you only want to add one carbon. So that doesn't mean it's not possible. Then anybody come up with other ways to do that? Okay. Uh, and then I did, uh, I followed that up with another um, anti mark uh, mark now. Well, now at this point you still have too many carbons. At what point do you get rid of carbons? Let's, let's draw this out. So. If you. Do this from that first step, right? Yeah, there's one. Okay. There's so there's one carbon here. Uh -huh. And then you add the acetylide. You're right, I see it now. Yeah. Right? Then you have oops, 
this. So, yeah, so you could actually uh, do O's analysis here. Um, although when you cleave that, when you cleave a triple bond, it usually will form the acid, but that's okay. And then how do you get to the product? Yeah, yeah, this would be a reduction, right? You're going from the acid to the alcohol. So this can be reduced with lithium aluminum hydride. So that's one way to do it. So, so you're, the first two steps are OK, but then you have to use ozone analysis or ozone analysis? To break up, yeah, to cleave that. The, the triple bond? Yeah. Or you could reduce to a double bond and then cleave it. You know, either way, um, but that works. Now there's a little bit faster way, yeah. Um, the one we just did, 13, yeah. No, um, you shouldn't need that here. The alternate way is to once you get here, so after that first step. Make a Grignard. And then react with formaldehyde. gets you the product. So that's a little bit quicker. Um, and the key here, again, thinking retrosynthetically, the key to this is to notice what needs to be added on. Okay. Whenever you need to add something with an alcohol on, so when you need to just add an alcohol, we know that. That's addition. So you're going to need a double bond, and then you add, uh, do addition with hydration, you know, with acid and water, or hydroboration, or whatever. We know that. If you need to add an alcohol with a carbon, so if you need to form carbon-carbon bonds, and there's also alcohols there, there's a good bet that that usually comes from carbonyl chemistry. Because that's always going to be a way that you can add a carbon and an alcohol. Now you have to pick the right carbonyl, whether you want an aldehyde, a ketone, or an ester, depending on what product you want. But this is always a good bet that that's where that comes from. Right. And as we do some more practice with that, and, and as you do some more practice uh, working out the problems in Chapter 13, you'll start to see some of those patterns. But the carbon next to the alcohol, um, and adding that one on, is generally going to come from carbonyls. So you can start thinking about that and start thinking about Grignard chemistry that way. Questions? All right. So be ready for a real quiz on this and whatever we talk about today on Monday. OK. So now what happens, um, actually, hold on. I'm going to. Now what happens if you want to do something like this? Let's take a look at this type of a synthesis problem. You start with this molecule on this right on the right that has a bromine and an alcohol. And you end with this one on the left 
And what, again, what has changed? So thinking about this retrosynthetically, what have you added here? The what? Yeah, you've added a couple carbons here. <coughs> Basically this, right? That's what's added. And that's going on where the bromine was. So you've still got the alcohol and the three carbons, and now you've added this on to where that was. Okay? So you use the same technique that we just mentioned. You see, you notice that in this, the bond that you've made goes to a carbon that has an alcohol next to it. So this could very readily come from Grignard chemistry. And you might think, okay, great. What we're going to do is take acetone and add it to this sort of Grignard. Right? And that Grignard can be easily made from the starting material. But there's a problem here. What's the problem? Why is that not as easy, as simple as it looks? The reason it's not as simple as it looks is that this molecule cannot exist. Why is that? Well, that's a Grignard reagent. We've, we know we have those. I guess technically we would write that the other way, but. Is that because the magnesium would go after the alcohol? Right. A Grignard is a really, really strong base, right? We thought of it as a negatively charged carbon. So the instant you tried to make this, it would attack another molecule and do an acid-base reaction. And what you would get is a very rapid uh, conversion to this kind of a molecule. So the, the very acidic, or very basic carbon anion type Grignard reagent would find another one of these around, maybe something that was unreacted, Oops. and do an acid-base reaction. As soon as it were, as soon as it was made. So you'd never actually get a Grignard reagent. And that is, is one of our important guidelines for Grignard reagents. So no acidic protons around Grignard reagents. So this wouldn't work. You can't make that. And try to get that in your head as best you can, because every year I see plenty of syntheses that have Grignards with alcohols or with amines on them, um, any kind of source of acidic proton. You can't do that. Wait. Uh, I don't know. Some of us said some, 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 a little wrong there. Now, there's a way to get around this. We we're going to talk about that now. Maybe that's what they were trying to refer to. I don't know. But you can't do this directly because okay? they will just react with each other. And this is why those, um, those basic ideas of things like acid-base chemistry, substitution, you always have to keep in your head, are there competing reactions that might happen here? Are there things that... Is this going to do what I want it to do, or is there something else that's probably going to happen instead? Um, always be asking yourself that when you're trying to find steps of these syntheses. So let's look at a way around this.
the way that you fix this is called protecting group chemistry. And you can protect alcohols with other things that won't react with grignards. Then you can do the reaction. Let's look at how that works. Let's stick with the same molecule. What you do is you react this first with a molecule called uh, trimethylsilyl chloride, which looks like this. TMSCL. Now silicon has uh, various interesting properties. It's similar to carbon, um, but not entirely the same. And one thing it does is it has a particular affinity for oxygen. So it will bond preferentially to oxygen um, over many other atoms. And it does basically substitution chemistry. And oh, you have to do this in the presence of base. Usually trimethylamine is a common one, or, or sometimes pyridine. And you end up with this molecule. Which can also be written as Now the oxygen comes from the alcohol. That's still there. Nothing's changed. The TMS comes from the TMSCL. And the byproducts are um, triethyl ammonium and uh, chloride from the, from the CL here. So now we say this is protected. This functional group, this silicon bit, will not react with Grignard reagents. It's not acidic anymore. I mean, look at it. It doesn't have any acidic hydrogens that can be taken off by a strong base. So this is stable in the presence of strong base. And that's very handy because now we can actually um, do the reaction that we want it to. So you can, you can make this Grignard now. That's a perfectly stable Grignard. Do whatever you want to it. So now we've added this uh, acetone on. And then you remove the protecting group. Using either a source of fluoride. Fluoride has even a greater affinity to silicon than oxygen. So it will preferentially attack the silicon and get rid of the rest of it. Or in this case, you can also use acid and water, although with other protecting groups that's not going to work. And that gets you the final product that you wanted. Whoops, hang on, we lost a carbon here somewhere. Oh, yeah. 
down here. Sorry. Let's fix this. There we go. And that's the product that we wanted back at the beginning. What? It's removed by the fluoride. This is protecting the alcohol from the Grignard here. And then you can remove it at the end to get the alcohol back. Um, right, the atom or the chemical that's commonly used, so you don't actually just use this ion. The chemical that's commonly used is tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. Which is this. And that's abbreviated TBAF. And the, actually, um, when you have that presence there, the uh, proton actually comes from the solvent, whatever solvent you do it in. And then it's balanced ionically because you're putting in this salt. Um, so yeah, don't add just F minus, uh, add TBAF. You can use other sources of that, like um, sodium fluoride. But well, let's talk about that. Why might this be a better choice than sodium fluoride? What's the advantage of that big uh, ammonium ion as a positive ion rather than something like sodium? Mm -hmm. No, not really. Hmm? Well, no. I mean, in either case, the fluorine can hydrogen bond. This certainly <coughs> doesn't have any hydrogen bonding. Other ideas? Is it still bulky that they can only become one and? Yeah, yeah, the bulkiness is certainly the, the main reason here. Um, the reason is it makes it much more soluble, a couple of reasons. It makes it much more soluble in organic solvents like alcohols because now you have these organic parts coming off. Sodium fluoride is not a particularly soluble anion or uh, salt, excuse me, because sodium and fluorine attract sodium and fluoride attract each other so strongly. They're both pretty strong, small ions. Now you have a big ion where the positive charge is centered more in the middle, and a small fluoride ion, so they actually can't interact as much. Which means that uh, that salt, that solid, can break up more easily in solution, and the fluoride can be more available for reaction. So it's actually a little bit more reactive source of fluorine in solution, or fluoride in solution, than something like sodium fluoride. Yeah. So why not hydrofluoric acid? What? Why not hydrofluoric acid? Uh, similar reason. Hydrofluoric acid is actually a weak acid. And so you don't have a lot of dissociation between the H and the F in solution. Um, other reason is hydrofluoric acid is really nasty to work with, um, because that's like, hydrofluoric acid is like the acid that you see in movies that will like go through four floors if you get it on the, you know, just like eats through everything, eats through your bones and uh, everything else. Yeah. What? Yes, it's a weak acid. Yeah, but what's the definition of a weak acid or a strong acid from a chemistry standpoint? Right. A strong acid dissociates fully in solution and a weak acid doesn't. So it has nothing to do with its corrosiveness. It just has to do with its ionic behavior in solution. Um, but yeah, HF will eat through glass, so you have, can't keep it in glass containers. You have to keep it in steel or these days plastic. Um, it'll eat through ceramic. It'll eat through pretty much anything 
that's, that's made of silica or silica, and it'll be through rocks and stones and bricks and all of that. So that's another reason to use this, is it's a little bit less nasty. Yeah, yeah, we'll just, we got a bucket of it upstairs. You can go throw it around if you want. Okay, so that's how you protect those. So from, from now on, I don't want to see uh, any alcohols with Grignards specifically. All right, good. Let's talk about, all right, so now we've talked about how to make alcohols. We've talked about many different ways. We reviewed the ones that we know. We talked about some new ones through reduction. And then we also talked about how to protect those alcohols in reaction. So now we're going to talk about reactions of alcohols. And what they actually do. All right. First reactions of alcohols, again, we're going to review a little bit. Alcohols can do SN1 reactions. which, um, of course, the OH won't just leave on its own because it's a very strong base. It's a poor leaving group. But in the presence of acid, it can. So in the presence of like HX, HBr or whatever, you can form a hydronium that can leave. and then be substituted with the X there. Okay. So this is fine um, for tertiary alcohols. And it works OK, though slowly, for secondary alcohols. But what are the major drawbacks here of this reaction? Sure, you're making a carbocation, so all the problems with that are going to still be problems. What else? <clears throat> uh, competing reactions yeah. is always one with these, right? You're going to have elimination, potential for elimination. Um, as a competing reaction, you may have some stereochemical issues if this is if you have a, uh, um, an antiomerically pure starting material because you lose that stereochemistry when you when you get rid of the leaving group and form the carbocation. So, from a practical synthetic standpoint, there's probably a not not a lot of cases where this is really a, a good reaction to have in your toolbox. So, let's go on to the SN2 processes that, that are going to be a little bit more useful for those reasons. Okay. First one is SN2 with HBr, a primary alcohol will react with HBr in the same way. So you'll make a carbocation. It won't leave on its own because it's primary. It'll actually undergo substitution, SN2 type substitution with the bromine. Now, that's pretty specific to HBr. It doesn't work well, work well for HCl. Um, unless you use a co-catalyst of zinc chloride. And uh, definitely not for HF, maybe, maybe a little for, maybe for HI. That, that would probably work. It doesn't say in the book. But, um, again, it's, it's a possibility, but we're going to talk about a couple better ways to do this.
The first one is we're going to talk about um, using a tosylate. And this is going to be important because of the stereochemical significance. So let's say you have an, an antimerically pure R2-butanol. What happens to the stereochemistry if I make a tosylate? Well, think about it. Think about the mechanism of the tosylate formation. Does it change the stereochemistry? Does it keep it the same or invert it? This doesn't change. Why not? Um, not quite. Any ideas, or you just think it doesn't change? I just remember that it doesn't. Okay. Introduce that and come back to this this theoretical change because the total. Well, just 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 this step, just the formation of the tosylate. It just takes a hydrogen away and it doesn't really like attack any carbons or anything. Right. Exactly. So. The oxygen attacks the tosyl here, releasing the chloride. So nothing ever happens with this carbon, um, which means that that is not going to affect the stereochemistry. Because that carbon's not involved in the reaction. So now, let's say. you put in a source of bromide, like sodium bromide. You're going to get an SN2 reaction. And so now what happens to the stereochemistry? It's inverted because of SN2 process. It's always going uh, to come from the other side. So the overall effect here then is the inversion is the inversion of configuration. Everybody see that? Okay, now the we've done that, you've seen that before. Now we're gonna compare that to a couple new methods. We're going to use thionyl chloride and phosphorus tribromide. Um, this is what we're going to do in lab today. In these cases, these molecules will react with primary and secondary alcohols to form the corresponding halides. So if you have something like this, both generally done in the presence of base, like pyridine as well. Well, that's not what we're going to use today. Actually, wait, are we using thionyl chloride today or are we using HCl? HCl? HCl, that's right, okay. And we're going to see why that's not always a great choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't have pyridine used in this case. So I would put a little star here or something. This is probably the most effective way to do this. All right, if you're going to put halogens, if you're going to replace alcohols with halogens, this is the type of chemistry that you want to do. These are both SN2 processes. which has some stereochemical consequences. So let's talk first about um, the thionyl chloride mechanism. They're basically the same, so um, let me just get a little more room here. Now we can do it here. Oh. Okay. 
Again, the alcohol, bad leaving group. And we react with thionyl chloride, which looks like this. So that word thionyl is like carbonyl, but thio meaning sulfur. And this alcohol is going to add to the sulfur like this. And then much like in the Grignard or um, hydride reactions, you'll reform this thionyl and kick off a chloride leaving group. Oh, whoops, I should have a positive charge here too. And now you have an interesting step uh, that allows you to replace it. Well, I guess, okay, first let's get rid of our hydrogen here. Then we'll talk about the interesting step. So you got your pyridine deprotonates the hydrogen. And you end up with this thing. And now this is a particularly good leaving group, and let's see why. So even a weak nucleophile like chloride, which came off over here, so that's still there. Even a weak nucleophile like chloride can now attack here, and watch how this leaves. These electrons actually go to form a double bond between the sulfur and the oxygen, and then another chloride leaves. So you've made your alkyl chloride, and then the byproducts are sulfur dioxide, which is a gas, and chloride ion. So it's highly irreversible because whenever you form a gas, uh, if you allow the gas to bubble out or even be in solution, it's unlikely that it'll then go backwards. Right. And that's why, this, uh, that's why this works and why you need that special reagent. Uh, you make the oxygen into, into such a good leaving group that it sort of has to leave and ends up being replaced by the chloride. Um, if you look here, this step right here is the SN2 step. So if that were a stereocenter, that's where you would get uh, inversion of configuration again. We're not going to go through the PBR3 mechanism. It's pretty much the same thing you can see in your book. So let's look at a problem of how we might use this. We're going to do kind of two stereoselective processes, or stereo, well, get the idea. We're going to say, how do we do this in two different ways? Selectively get the chloride on a dash, or selectively get it on a wedge. Okay. So going back through those couple of reactions that we just talked about, See if you can come up with the conditions that selectively do one or the other. Um, so the first one should be fairly straightforward. Any of the methods, the SN2 methods we talked about uh, would be the best here. And I would recommend using the thionyl chloride uh, with purity. And you can do that in one nice, easy step. Okay. So what happens if you want the same configuration? What do you do? Well, yes, but then you still have to do the substitution, which will invert your configuration. 
a double substitution, right. So what you might have to do in this case is something like maybe you put a bromine on there and then you try to substitute it with a chloride. Right? That could give you that substitution that you need. Um, maybe you put a tosylate on there and then another and then actually do a substitution with water where you put another so you end up with the, the other OH then use the ideal chloride. So that kind of thing. But yeah, doing this now, you can do a double substitution and still get what you want. All right, any questions about those? OK, Monday we will finish up talking about al uh, oxidation of alcohols, and then uh, we'll be done with Chapter 13. So I'll see you upstairs in about 10 minutes.